we the sovereign Filipino people imploring the aid of the Almighty God in order to build a just and humane society and establish a government that shall embody our ideals and aspirations, promote the common good, conserve and develop our patrimony, and to secure to ourselves and our posterity the blessings and independence of democracy under the rule of law and a regime of truth, justice, freedom, love, equality, and peace. Do ordain and promulgate this constitution. This is very encouraging. The preamble is an important statement of purpose and principle. It assists in the interpretation of certain provisions. But as the law books say, it is not the source of right in itself. Several constitutions around the world, in fact, have peace in their preamble. Countries as diverse as Ghana, Marshall Islands, Laos, Turkmenistan, Eritrea, and Micronesia. But the preamble is not enough. We need a stronger, more straightforward provision to conclude that peace is a constitutional imperative. I found this gem of a provision in Article 2, Section 2. The Philippines renounces war as an instrument of national policy, adopts generally accepted principles of international law as part of the law of the land, and adheres to the policy of peace, equality, justice, freedom, cooperation, and amity with all nations. What exactly will this provision allow or disallow? Was President Macapagal Arroyo's support for the unilateral attack on Iraq and the U.S.-led coalition of the willing a violation of this provision? What about its all-out war strategy on the communist insurgency? Hmm, these are all very serious questions as any culpable violation of the Constitution is a ground for impeachment. So what does it mean for the country to renounce war as a national policy? The article actually is not new. It was carried over from the 1973 Constitution, which adopted its first draft from the 1935 Constitution. According to former commissioners Joaquin Bernas and Jose Noliedo, who argued in their constitutional law book, The renunciation of war as national policy was based on the Kellogg-Bryan Pact, or the General Treaty for the Renunciation of War. This was signed by several nations on August 25, 1928. Kellogg Bryan, uh, which was in 1928, uh, had not yet declared, or w when that was uh, uh, adopted, it did not actually mean aggressive war was already prohibited in international law. That had, that had to take a few years later. It was after World War II where there was that consensus uh, there is Article 2, Section 4 of the UN Charter, which, which is essentially the principle of the prohibition of the use of force, is the parallel provision to that provision in the Philippine Constitution, which is why you find the renunciation of war in the same sentence as the adoption of generally accepted principles of international law. So long as international law prohibits the use of force, then uh, the Philippine Constitution is in line with, with, with that aspiration. All three commissioners, however, stress that the provision does not ban all wars, only wars of aggression. Defensive war is not outlawed, for the power to wage defensive war is the very essence of sovereignty. In this regard, as in the past Constitution, only the Congress, by a vote of two-thirds of both houses in joint session assembled, voting separately, shall have the power to declare the existence of a state of war. Well, so far, this power to declare war, thankfully, has not been tapped. Only a strange variant of it has mutated under the current president, who, in 2001 and 6, has declared a constitutionally non-existent state of rebellion. Now, what about the so-called preventive or preemptive war launched by the U.S. against Saddam Hussein's Iraq? Was that a defensive war or a war of aggression? In supporting this war, was our president guilty of culpable violation of the Constitution? 
Let's see what our drafters have to say about that. Actually, that's a very that's a very interesting question. Why? On what basis? On what source of intelligence did we base our participation? So that if we indeed engage, and we found out later, in fact, that that intelligence was flawed, both in the British and the U.S. Uh, uh, oversight committees in Congress and or Parliament, then we were acting on the basis of flawed intelligence. Which is, and what makes it worse, it was not our intelligence, it was borrowed. Were there other means of ensuring our national security and the safety of our people and our communities? And that must have been or should have been examined much more profoundly rather than simply following the beat of another drum, you know, simply because it was a foreign power that we were so dependent on. You see, for me, uh, preemptive wars are something that we don't perhaps uh, is something that I would not, uh, I, I do not believe we, we would subscribe to, especially because there are other ways you know, uh, in which one should be able to have the intelligence and the capacity to meet these kind of challenges. I felt that we were kind of uh, going out on a limb. Do you think that's a basis for impeachment? Well, in fact, uh, these were in fact some questions that were raised in the British Parliament with regards to the Blair handling of, of this particular question and also in the case of the U.S., obviously, but as we all know from our experience, now impeachment is a political process and very often the numbers dictate rather than the principles concerned or the rightness of one's cause. Even now, when there, are, when there could be clear evidence regarding certain things, obviously impeachment does not prosper because of the numbers gained. I think many people participated in that based on inaccurate or erroneous evidence presented by the United States. Is that something which we may consider a violation of the Constitution? Well, yes, I, I think, I think the, that's the role of the legislature and the, uh, and the Supreme Court. Uh, because uh, that would become, a, that, that's a national, it's, it's a national decision. And you cannot exclude the legislature and Supreme Court from such a decision. There are new areas of debate and uh, discussion in, in uh, in the post 9-11, or actually not even post, I, the first humanitarian intervention uh, from, from the Balkan tragedy and from Rwanda, you had this whole uh, argument that states should in fact use force to prevent human rights violations, use force to prevent uh, humanitarian catastrophes. In post 9-11, you have all of this um, need to pre to go to use of force uh, in a preemptive way. Is the enforcement sanctions within the UN process? I think that's chapter seven of the UN Charter. Is that, is, is that ex an exclusive process? Does it bind states from following that process alone when they choose to enter into uh, uh, non non-peaceful means of settling their dispute. No? Is, that, is it, is it uh, binding or can states on their own do so? That, that's really a question. The activist in me, the peacenik in me would, would say, yes, um, America was in violation of international law by invading Iraq. But the world is not so simple. You know, um, I think it was right to force the Taliban out of Afghanistan for the violations of human rights against women and their people. That's my view. No? Uh, so the humanitarian in me or the human rights advocate in me, you know, has, I, 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 I would also say, I think the state should intervene in, in Darfur. The state should have intervened sooner in Rwanda. The powerful states are ready to go to war against Iraq because of the interest there, but they're not ready to go to war against Burma. It's, very, it's a very selective application, but what's good for uh, one should be good for Pedro and Maria as well. I think there is changing uh, paradigms. Ultimately, you know, uh, there are principles of international law that are 
uh, in flux, that are in flux right now. There, I, I still believe that there is a prohibition on the use of force, but uh, uh, and that therefore states should uh, should refrain from acts of aggression, and that should inform us. But that, uh, but uh, on the issues of humanitarian intervention, grave abuses of human rights, or even the issue of terrorism. No, I'm not so sure. Indeed, the questions and replies are relevant not only with regards to Iraq, but to future non-UN sanctioned interventions, say, in North Korea or Iran, the two other countries making up George Bush's axis of evil. It is relevant not only with regards to the present occupants in Malacanang, but to all our future presidents. Certainly, next time, should there be a next time, will be a good time to pose a challenge before the Supreme Court or Congress. Now, to move on to our second line of inquiry. Does the renunciation of war policy also apply to the armed conflicts between the government and the Moro and Communist armed groups? I raise this question with international human rights and humanitarian law in mind. How the various conventions and protocols effectively have the force of domestic law. I think war under under section two of the Declaration of Principles was more there it was applicable to foreign policy. All these you know UN declarations and so on are part of the law of our land uh, and are properly reflected in the provisions of the Constitution. Uh, I think it it does apply to the domestic uh, situation, but international law does not only deal with the relations between states. It's also the international law just as much adopts state behavior to their citizens. So from my point of view, that provision about peace and adoption of generally accepted principles of international law also means the Philippines must treat its own people according to those international standards. That provision just highlights that that uh, if we are really to be a good citizen of the world, then we should really, we, we, should not, we cannot pick and choose. You see, in the context of the Philippines, which was then uh, kind of besieged you know, by, by violent conflicts, both in Mindanao and in the rest of the country, you see, that, that therefore retains a particular, particular context in history. A country at peace, see, a, a country at peace with itself and at peace with the world. You know, so... <laughs> That's the way I, I understood it. it. It renounces war as a national policy. If you really uh, translate that into specifics, no, and I hope that our our congressman would would take that in terms of that this is not only in terms of foreign relations but on the domestic front, no, because that uh, that uh, provision uh, would be the best uh, this uh, anchor of for. Uh, policies, you know. Peace. Who doesn't want it? But what does it mean? How did the framers use and understand the term? Interestingly, some saw the need to qualify the concept of democracy with adjectives like popular or participatory. But no one saw the need to qualify peace. Peace was understood to be the fruit.